Uh, we're going to get going. Uh, so thank you all very much for coming this morning to talk about the withdrawal agreement bill, um, which perhaps in a sort of uh, uh, show of uh, what's to come uh, was seen off in not very long. Business collapsed after Stephen Crabb was telling me that basically there was only four and a half hours instead of the eight that the government had scheduled taken yesterday. So that might show actually what's changed in Parliament. But as we know, the withdrawal agreement bill has still got to go through the Lords. Um, and there is still likely to be uh, lots, of, uh, lots of issues with devolved administrations. Uh, so we've got a very distinguished panel that I'm going to introduce in a second, but I'm just going to make a couple of housekeeping announcements. First of all, I'm not Joe Owen. Um, Joe, unfortunately, doesn't feel very well this morning, so I'm taking over chairing from him. I'm Joe Rutter. I'm a senior fellow here at the Institute for Government. I'm just going to give you a couple of housekeeping announcements. Remember, this is on the record and it is being live streamed. So uh, take proper care if you want to ask something uh, that you don't want to be broadcast simultaneously to the nation. Uh, join the conversation on Twitter, hashtag IFG Brexit, and you can also follow us on at IFG events. There's no fire alarm scheduled. Uh, I made that bit up, but I'm assuming there's no fire alarm scheduled. But in the event of a fire alarm, please exit the building down the stairs, do not use the lift and gather outside by the King George VI statue. And finally, and this did happen, I think, at the last event, almost the last event I chaired at the IFG, uh, if there is a first aid incident, leave it to us to contact uh, the ambulance. We had a bit of confusion last time. Please clear the room, and our designated first aiders will take charge. So uh, we will be in control. So let's move on to the business before us. Um, very delighted to have, as I said, a very distinguished panel. Uh, a year ago, Almost to the day, I think, uh, we had Stephen Crabb here and we were looking forward to the prospects for the Prime Minister's meaningful vote. Uh, and that was a week before the Prime Minister went down to, uh, down to her biggest ever, the biggest ever defeat we'd seen in Parliament. Uh, things have changed now. But one thing that hasn't changed is we have Stephen Crabb and Joanna Cherry both making comebacks to an IFG panel. So Stephen Crabb is Conservative MP for Priscelli, Pembrokeshire and former Secretary of State for Wales and for Work and Pensions and was a member of the exiting the EU committee in the last parliament. Uh, Joanna Cherry QC is the SNP MP for Edinburgh South West, SNP spokesperson on justice and home affairs, also a member of the exiting EU committee in the last parliament. It'd be quite interesting to know whether we get an exiting the EU committee or something like that in the next parliament or in this parliament. Um, but we're joined by ver two very distinguished peers because we said that actually the Lord's consideration, given the Commons majority, is likely to be much more interesting and testing for the government than Commons is. So on my left is Lord Anderson of Ipswich QC. He's a barrister at Brick Court Chambers and crossbench peer. He's also a member of the House of Lords EU Justice Subcommittee. And last but certainly not least, Baroness Hayter of Kentish Town, who's Shadow Deputy Labour Leader and Shadow Brexit Minister in the House of Lords. So what we're going to do, I'm going to kick off with sort of questions for a bit, but we will then move on to all of your questions. Uh, it's quite difficult to see in here, so if I don't seem to be noticing you, please do wave, and there are roving mics that we will go to. So I'm going to start off. Stephen, now the government's got a majority, is this all just going to be a breeze for the government we saw you know, last night? You know, a Conservative MP is just going to troop through the lobbies and support the government on everything, or are there going to be any areas where uh, Conservative MPs might make their misgivings a bit known? So it's not going to be a breeze. This year isn't going to be a breeze for the government. There's a lot of big challenges and complications ahead. But if we're talking purely about the bill and the passage of the bill through, through the House of Commons at least, then on the basis of yesterday's evidence, then yes, um, there is very little appetite um, on my side of the House amongst Conservative backbenchers for... Well, I think there was one amendment that was on the order paper yesterday that Conservatives had put their name to, and that was the, the amendment that Big Ben should bong um, <laughs> at the hour Regrettably that Regrettably not selected. That, that it was not selected for, de for debate. Um, look, bear in mind the sheer number of new MPs that we have who are, you know, with no disrespect at all, still at the stage of asking <laughs> directions to the cloakroom and um, why do people keep standing up in between questions to, mm. and looking at the speaker. Oh. I mean, literally, that's the, the, the page one, chapter one of, of how to be an MP. So the, they're, they're just not at the, the stage where they're going to be getting into the meat of the legislation. 
Don't forget that group that we also had in the last parliament, your Dominic Greaves and people like that, who for them this was their bread and butter. Those people are no longer around. There isn't that group of, um, if I can call them Remainers, in, mm. in hardcore Remainers inside the Conservative Party that have really got an appetite for creating problems with the bill. Um, so the dynamics have all changed. It does feel like we're on a very different page, uh, a positive one. And yes, you know, the bill is going to go through the, 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 the Commons Committee stage again today. You're going to see majorities of around 90 that we saw last mm. night. Um, whether it occupies the full eight hours of allotted time today, I don't know. Um, but it's going to be the House of Lords is where the, the action is going to be in terms of the, the passage of the bill. So, Diane, that then transfers the ball. You're going to get the withdrawal agreement bill pretty much in its current form. Government made some changes to the withdrawal agreement bill that it presented when it thought it actually had to try and get some cross-party support to pass it, the bill that got second reading before the election. So how are you going to approach scrutiny, particularly given that probably the only manifesto commitment anyone can remember was that the Prime Minister would get Brexit done by the 31st of January. There wasn't actually huge amounts else of substance in the Conservative manifesto. Uh, so how, is the, how are the laws going to go about scrutiny? Uh, well, we're going to certainly do more, do more than, than will happen in the Commons. I mean, there are some really big issues in this bill. There always were in the, in the original bill, but this one is so much worse. Um, and getting Brexit done is not about the, the big question, which is how you do it. Uh, and that remains, and it's the sort of issues for us. Um, there are particularly important issues about the degree of parliamentary involvement. There's the most extraordinary uh, clause in here. I think it's clause 38. Mm -hmm. uh, it says something like the UK government uh, parliament is sovereign. And then all the other clauses, and I've forgotten how many mm. other clauses are, completely undermine that mm. because actually they've taken away parliamentary scrutiny mm. over just about mm. everything. So they, they abolish the Ben Bill, abolish the Cooper Bill, abolish the Meaningful Vote, disapply CRAG, um, and take away any parliamentary involvement either over the Joint Committee, which will oversee the implementation, um, or indeed any <coughs> oversight of the future negotiations. So actually, what is key in this, and I, you know, my fear is whether this is just about Brexit or whether this is going to go much further and be the way this government is working, is saying, actually, we don't care about Parliament. Partly because of the reasons that Stephen said, mm. because they've so got the Commons tied up, um, that they are now just saying, well, we don't even now bother, we don't even pretend in this bill that there's any parliamentary involvement. Um, there are a lot of my colleagues from the Lords in the audience, and I know that this will be an issue that I think all of them will be saying, hang on, hang on, Henry, hang on. Um, what are the consequences of you actually wanting to bring out, uh, I'll finish a moment, I know we're meant to be quick, uh, bring us out uh, uh, of the EU, basically by diktat of the government, rather than by the say of Parliament. And I think that is an absolute <coughs> crucial issue. And in, it's, in a way, it's symptomatic that they've put in this stupid clause, which says, and you can't even apply for an extension to the transition period, regardless of what happens, regardless of whether the Welsh government's been consulted, there'll be no consultation, there'll be no consultation with the Scottish government, whatever. We're going to bring you out without extending that, and we're going to write in law you can't extend it. So never mind the UK interest. So there are some really big democratic issues in here that I think we will rehearse at length. But at the end of the day, the laws won't stand in the way, will it, of exit on the 31st of January? It, as I say, it's not, uh, it's not about stopping exit on the 31st of January. It is about trying to make sure that there is some hold over the government after that. Um, and I, 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 I do think that's something. I, I, it's going to be very difficult back in the Commons with all these new members who owe their uh, position to, to Boris Johnson, but I, I think at the very least they have to hear that this is being done in a way that will undermine the House of Commons. One of the, the principal reason, of course, that the business collapsed last night is the Labour Party didn't show up. You know, if they voted against the programme motion, they said there wasn't enough time for all scrutinising all of these important issues you raise, and then 
didn't show up in the chamber to We, to we were having the hustings for our oh, new well, leader. So. Other business. <laughs> though, but yeah. presumably, you rather could, important, actually. Mm. <laughs> but presumably you could have decided when to schedule the hustings for a leader. I mean, yeah, if it, we'd been sort of with this as a sort of big fulcrum of debate. Oh, I'm sorry, the PLP meets at six o'clock. I mean, it's what we okay. do. <laughs> and okay. we've done it for a hundred and something years. So. Okay, sorry, well, nothing will get in the way of uh, Labour hustings mm. or whatever. So, David, I mean, quite a lot of the testing of the withdrawal Act, the you would all like things that came from crossbench peers in the Lords, and lots of concerns <coughs> actually about the way the government was going about <coughs> legislating. So, how are the crossbenchers going to approach this legislation? Well, I'm sure Stephen is right that the mood has changed in Parliament. This is going to take some imagination for those of us who haven't been there very long. In fact, uh, even people who've been there 10 years have not really experienced single party government with a large majority. And I think also NGOs and think tanks and so on uh, are going to have to react. When the original bill was published, um, people were writing articles saying uh, you know, it's a, there's a scope for involving Parliament much more and it ought to have the right to decide on whether there should be an extension or not, just, not just a veto on uh, the decision to seek an extension. Uh, people were saying you have to enhance parliamentary scrutiny um, on delegated legislation um, because what they uh, gave us in the uh, in the bill was less good than what we achieved in the European uh, Union Withdrawal Act of 2018. Um, but far from responding to those, the government's gone in the other direction. It's actually removed most of the important parliamentary scrutiny, um, and there are some new and, in my view, rather frightening um, delegated powers. Now, how do we react to that in the Lords? Um, it seems to me there is a distinction between uh, raising matters on committee and when appropriate, putting them to a vote on report stage, which I think we should um, continue to do, do full-heartedly. And then what happens at ping pong? And I can understand that at the end of the day, we always give way to the um, elected house, and that's absolutely right and proper. Um, but I don't think that in any way lets us off the hook. And that's why you know, we've set, set down three days for committee, two days for report. I hope we will give the bill a really good working over. And you mentioned uh, the delegated powers legislation, but as a sort of lawyer looking at this, you know, put your other hat on it rather than a crossbench peer, what are you, what are you particularly sort of struck by or worried by in the bill? Well, I think the two biggest areas which are dominated by delegated legislation are the transition period uh, and citizens' rights. And uh, the scope of the delegated powers is vast. I think my favourite one on the transition period, I just find it, it's the new uh, Section 8A of the 2018 Act. There's a power uh, to make such provision as the Minister considers appropriate for any purpose of or in connection with Part 4 of the Withdrawal Agreement. That's the transition period. Now that sunsets at the end of the uh, transition period, but nonetheless the power is uh, a huge one. Some of these powers aren't quite as big as they look um, because some of them are there in order to give effect to directly applicable law as set out in the withdrawal agreement. So for example, there's what looks like a very broad power for the minister uh, to set a deadline for citizens to register for settled status. Um, but when you look at the withdrawal agreement, it says, well, that must be at least six months after the end of the, mm. of the transition period. So we know that's not going mm. to be before June 2021, mm. and it's probably reasonable to give the Minister of Power to, mm. to, 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 to do it afterwards. Um, the scrutiny, as I said, has gone backwards. Um, and what we, or what actually my predecessors, because I wasn't even in the House of Lords mm. at that stage, but what they achieved was a sifting process mm. uh, whereby uh, specialist committees in each house mm. could uh, look at all the statutory instruments, decide which ones needed to go by the affirmative resolution procedures, they could only come into force by a, a, a vote of uh, both houses. Um, and that, I think, has worked tolerably well under the 2018 Act, despite the vast volume of, of, of reg regulations going through under that. I very much hope we can devise uh, something similar. But the worst, can I, can I raise what I think is, yeah. <laughs> to my mind at least, it's, it's the most troubling um, uh, delegated power. And may I just give a plug here for Joanna Cherry and her colleagues in the oh, SNP, sure. who I think are the only people so far who showed any interest mm -hmm. in this in the Commons. They certainly put an amendment down, mm. which uh, may, maybe, I don't know, maybe may called for debate today. Um, but it relates to the judges. Mm. Uh, and under the previous draft of the bill, the question is, what do you do with um, European <coughs> law? Um, the judgments of the European Court, mm. once the transition period is over, what effect are they to be given? And the solution arrived at last time was um, you keep on following the European Court unless the Supreme Court decides you can uh, depart from that. And I think the judges certainly were quite happy with that. What the new Clause 26 says, and it's completely new, is it gives the uh, 
minister a power by delegated legislation uh, to choose particular courts or categories of court and uh, tell them uh, what uh, principles to apply to the jurisprudence of the European Court in particular areas of law. Now, I think that's quite threatening, really, for three reasons. Um, first, obviously, there's the independence of the judiciary. Uh, secondly, there is legal certainty. Um, who knows when the regulation will strike, and therefore what a, a, a well-established piece of EU law will be deemed uh, uh, to mean in the uh, UK. And then thirdly, of course, there's, is this a permissible use of delegated legislation? So I'm also proposing to put my name oh. to an amendment to the Lords. We wish Joanna <coughs> the best of luck with, with her <coughs> comments. Um, but that to me is, is quite a worrying one. And it may be, I mean, I, I'm probably completely naive mm. because I've, I've not been around mm. politics for nearly as long as, as the others. But it just seemed to me this, this could be a point where, you know, if there is enough head of steam, if mm. the judges and former judges are registering their concern about this, uh, that is sufficiently technical that who knows, perhaps um, the government might make a concession or it might be persuaded to move. I'm just going to throw it to John, I'm going to come to you. Stephen, do you see any prospect? I mean, if you know, there is a mass ranks of sort of, you know, law lords, whatever, all expressing reservations about this. Do you think the government, I mean, does the government just see this as a test that basically what we say goes and we're not going to listen to any amendments? Or do you think the government will be minded to actually look at potential improvements that come, particularly from the cross benches and the lords? So, 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 so the idea that the government just wants to plough on and isn't interested at all in any of the, the points of detail or the concerns that have been raised, I don't think is accurate. You know, there, there are smart, intelligent people there who have their ears open. What they do want to demonstrate on the back of what they believe the mandate they've been given yeah. from the voters is, is to show purpose and to show that they can, they can deliver. I, I expect when we get to the House of Lords, you will, you will see ministers being far more engaging with, with this um, because that will be the, the place where any concessions do get made. And I wouldn't rule out the government making concessions, but certainly at this initial stage on the yeah. back of the election results so soon uh, before Christmas, the, yeah, the determination is to show purpose and to get this done. Joanna, the, uh, you've already been, got an honourable call out for some of your amendments. The SNP has tabled really quite a lot of amendments to, to the bill. So, Virg, just to outline what your principal concerns are. Well, I would very much endorse what David has said. I mean, the, the Tory manifesto revealed that the, their, they aim to change the balance between the government, parliaments and the courts. And I think this bill is very much the beginning of that. I, I believe that the government are still smarting from the defeat that I and others inflicted upon them in the Supreme Court. But I don't think that's any way to really go about rebalancing the British constitution. And I think there are very legitimate concerns shared cross-party, and I'm sure also shared by some Conservative MPs, mm. but I don't think those will be reflected mm. in the way in which the Conservative mm. MPs vote. Um, I think this bill is really about the British government, the current government, grabbing to itself as much power as it can from the devolved assemblies, from the Westminster Parliament, and also, as David has outlined, uh, from uh, the judiciary. And uh, yesterday I raised with the Minister the fact that the Scottish Parliament Information Centre, which is the equivalent of the House of Commons Library at Holyrood, they produced a very detailed report uh, yesterday noting that Clause 3, Clause 18, a number of other clauses in the bill empower UK government ministers <coughs> to uh, acting alone, that is without the agreement of devolved administrations, to make delegated legislation which will affect devolved competences. Now, for a long time, I and my colleagues have been saying that Brexit's being used as a smokescreen for a, a power grab, forgive the soundbite, on the devolved assemblies, and that has been ridiculed. But this independent report clearly shows that that is the case. And when I questioned the minister yesterday, he was un unable to give me any assurance that that is not what this will be used for. And if you look at the bill as a whole, I think it's really quite egregious that the House of Lords, no disrespect to my fellow panellists, but it's an unelected chamber, the House of Lords under Clause 28 will have more power to scrutinise the British government's delegated legislation than will either uh, the Welsh Assembly, the Scottish Parliament, or the Northern Ireland Assembly, if it hopefully gets 
up and running again. And, and I think that's unacceptable. And I'd just like to add this. There was a lot of rhetoric in the chamber yesterday from the government benches about how the British people have spoken and really how any of us on the opposition benches raising any concerns about this bill were getting in the way of the much quoted will of the people. But I think it's worth remembering that Britain's not a unitary state. It, it, it consists of four nations and uh, the province of Northern Ireland. So four constituent parts. And both Scotland and Northern Ireland have on every occasion, they've had the opportunity to vote, including the 2016 referendum and all the elections since, voted overwhelmingly to remain in the European Union. And not only is there no recognition of that in relation to Scotland, there may arguably be some in relation to Northern Ireland, not only is there no recognition of that, the, the hard fact is that not one single amendment sponsored by my party has any chance of getting through in relation to this bill, despite the fact that my party won 48 of the 59 seats in Scotland. And of those 59 MPs in Scotland, only six support the government's agenda. All the rest are pro-Remain MPs, the Lib Dems, and Ian Murray, who's been a very forthright Labour MP in favour of Remain. Yet not one amendment that we table has a chance of getting through. Now, I would really just ask anyone, regardless of your views about Scottish independence, do you think that's a sustainable position within the union that the majority of you in Scotland will have no sway in this parliament whatsoever? And there's nothing <coughs> that I and my colleagues can do to protect the devolved settlement that we all thought was safe and uh, written in stone after the settled will of the Scottish people was expressed 75% in the referendum of 1997. I think that's very troubling for, for British democracy. And I know it's kind of slipped off the agenda because everyone's, well, not everyone, but the media is terribly excited about all these new Conservative MPs. But if you care about the union of the United Kingdom, then that's something that requires to be discussed because it, it's clearly not fair and it's clearly not democratic that we, we, by which I mean my SNP colleagues, I, and the majority of MPs in Scotland, including Labour and the Lib Dems, not one single amendment we put forward has a hope in hell of passing. The only hope is the Lord's. And with all due respect, they are not answerable to constituents in the way that I and Stephen are. So there's something very wrong with that and something very troubling. And taking that together with the way in which this bill emasculates Parliament and interferes with the separation of powers between the executive and judiciary, then I think this is a very uh, worrying moment for British democracy and those of us who care, even little Scottish nationalists like myself who care about the British constitution. So, Joanna, I mean, the Scottish government's refused consent even to this bill. Is there anything given where the SNP government stands on, uh, stands on Brexit. Is there anything the government could do substantially to the bill that would get consent? Or is it just sort of, you know, dead duck, just don't go there. The Scottish government is never going to consent to this piece of legislation just on principle. I think the harsh political reality is that the government won't do anything and there's no circumstances in which the, in which the Scottish Parliament will consent to this bill. But the harsh political reality is that the government will ignore the fact that the Scottish Parliament hasn't, won't consent. Mm -hmm. And as a result of the Supreme Court decision in the continuity bill, the Scottish <coughs> Parliament bill that was struck down as a result of retrospective changing of the law, again, in, in the Lords, not, not in the Commons, the reality is that the Sewell Convention is legally uh, unenforceable. So we are uh, uh, in very dire straits. And you remember my colleague, Mike Russell, when he mm. gave a, a mm. keynote lecture here uh, in the spring of last year, he pointed out that on many occasions the Scottish Government have approached the British mm. Government with suggestions for compromise, mm. suggestions for areas where there might be some space to meet in the middle, and on every single occasion the proposals have either been ignored or uh, rebuffed. Mm. So Diane, we've heard that uh, the Welsh First Minister Mark Gregford said he's sort of working with you on possibly some amendments. So. So what might those look like? Have you sort of got very far with what uh, yeah, where well, you might go? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's interesting. I mean, clearly the SNP has a different yeah. ag agenda from uh, those of us who are unionists, but, uh, and, and the Welsh, I think, would on the whole be in a position that they mm. could give uh, legislative consent to a bill they found mm. acceptable. Mm. And what's interesting is this bill is seen very differently from the, the, the first version. And at the moment, they are, as you know, saying mm. in its present mm. form, they do not think 
uh, that the Welsh uh, Assembly would, would, would give consent to it. Um, now, some of the issues that we had before mm. been discussing with mm. the Welsh Government were about where Parliament had a, a role mm. to make sure it's and the Welsh yeah. Assembly or <laughs> and the Welsh Government. So the an, initial amendments we had were to make sure it wasn't just Parliament, mm. but it, it was, um, I mean, mm. all the devolved authorities, obviously. obviously. Um, but, you know, if you lose the whole of parliamentary say, it's really hard even to see how those amendments mm. can go in. Um, to, 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 give, to give them some, but we do have some specific amendments that, that the Welsh Government think would um, at, at least move mm. this more uh, towards something they'd find acceptable. Um, and I am hoping if there is some compromise um, that for the sake of the Union, I mean, you know, we, we really cannot risk this bill. Um, undermining it for those of us who want to keep um, we want to keep the union, but we want to maintain the devolved settlement or even improve that. Um, and, and for this bill to under, undermine that is, is really difficult. So we, we will yeah. be working very closely with with them, and we're we're discussing yeah. the potential uh, changes yeah. now. So Stephen, where are, where are, where do you think the government is on this? Because obviously. It does have an agenda of keeping the union together. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and it must be quite worried that. Uh, and and that this I is, forget yeah. which of the panellists said that the, the agenda about the union seems to have kind of fallen off the edge, mm. I think is going to be a key theme of this parliament, and government is very minded of that. And I think there's a lot of people already thinking about the work that needs to go into um, thinking about the glue that binds the United Kingdom together. But this piece of legislation isn't going to be it. So whatever amendments the Welsh government might want, or I don't know whether the Scottish government would be pushing mm. amendments. This, this bill is not about the glue that binds the United Kingdom together. This bill mm. is about getting us to the, first step, to the first stage of Brexit, to the end of January, and then into the next phase, which is about the, the trade deals, where there may well be more discussions with the devolved nations about fu future trade deals. But, but would the government accept that some of the ways it's going about implementing Brexit is actually, you know, giving, you know, if we say, John, I might think this is very unfair, but we're giving the SNP more grievances that it's going to be able to... <laughs> yeah, I do think it's unfair. But, you know, it is adding to the idea that Scotland doesn't get a say, Wales doesn't get a say, whatever, you know, in the way it's legislating. I mean, the, the Would it see that as a, as a problem or...? The hard, you know, the hard truth is that in the last parliament, which was a hung parliament under a Theresa May-led government, the that the voices from Scotland and Wales were probably in a stronger position, yeah. uh, just because of the dynamics. Yeah. Um, and what I find remarkable is that, you know, Joanna's nodding in agreement mm. to that, but everything that the opponents of Brexit and the opponents of Theresa May did last year has helped sow the seeds mm. to the position that we're now mm. in, that the other panellists are saying are so much worse. Mm. They have helped create the phenomenon of the Boris Johnson success. I mean, it's remarkable. You know, we sat here almost exactly a year mm. ago mm. to the day I went back and looked at some of the comments I made 12 can, months ago. Can I come back on that? And yeah. Yeah. I, I looked back at some of the comments and, uh, you know, I got a lot wrong in, in what I said, mm. uh, how I thought the year would pan mm. out. Um, I, did, I did say, though, that I was profoundly pessimistic that a pragmatic mm. centre-ground majority would come together to pass Mm. Theresa May's mm. version of the withdrawal agreement, and, and that happened. You know, and I think one of the great counterfactuals yeah. that historians will, mm. and A-level students mm. will look back on is what would have happened had the likes of you know, the, the more pragmatic voices in the SNP, the Conservative Party and the mm. Labour Party actually said, you know what, this is probably the, this kind of soft Theresa May style Brexit is probably the best thing that's on the table. And you passed that opportunity no, up and yeah, you helped yeah. sow the seeds for the discontent that led to a Brexit led <laughs> leadership election for the Conservative Party, which led, led, okay. led directly to the general okay. election. Well, Joan, I'm going to let you come back very quickly on that, but we didn't want to stick to the substance. There's an incredibly Anglo centric yeah. view of the world, Stephen, because uh, the mandate which, on which I was elected on, and you know, I, I know no one's not terribly interested in the results in Scotland, but you know, my majority went from 1,000 to 12,000 in, in the election passed. You know, my constituency is full of the posh middle class suburbs of Edinburgh. They all voted SNP. Now, I'm not saying all of them want independence, but they accept the principle that there should be another independence referendum, but they most certainly don't want Brexit. My city voted 75%. Now, don't sure. say to me, oh, London voted against as well. Scotland is, is, Scot yeah. Scotland is a nation, and the idea that we would make a compromise to deliver something incredibly damaging to our economy and society <laughs> that we hadn't voted for 
is a very odd view of the situation. But, now, I understand yeah. what you're saying in relation to perhaps some of, some of your own colleagues and some English MPs. Perhaps they have been the author of their own misfortune. But frankly, I applaud what they did. I applaud what the likes of Dominic Grieve and Anna Subi did, because they did it out of a sense of caring about truth, a fact-based approach to life, not pie-in-the-sky nationalism, and I'm not a believer in pie-in-the-sky nationalism, incidentally, but a fact-based approach. What is good for our economy? What is good for our society? They took the view that the result had been very narrow in 2016, and they wanted to keep England and the UK as close to the single market and customs union as possible. Many of us did make compromises in, in the indicative uh, votes, but <laughs> You're looking at it very much from the perspective of, of the way that, of, of where you live voted. And I know you're a Welsh MP, mm. not an English MP, but that's the way you're looking at it. It's very different viewed from Scotland, and it's also very different viewed from Northern Ireland. And I think we'll get a flavour of that today, because it's going to be yeah. great once more to hear Irish nationalist voices yeah. on the floor of the House of Commons putting forward what is a majority view in Northern Ireland which is that the majority of people in Northern so, Ireland also want to remove. So it's very good you've raised your Northern Ireland, mm. Joanna, because I just wanted to very quickly come and then I'll come for questions. Um, Diane, David, there are going to be concerns. We've seen this cross-party move, amendments uh, on things like unfettered access and things like that. Yeah, and we know that the Northern Ireland Protocol is all going to be implemented through delegated powers when it's agreed in the Joint Committee. So what do you think the Lords is going to do on Northern Ireland? What questions is it going to be raising, Diane? I mean, I, I think the questions, in, in, in one sense, it is the absolute crux of our future relationship. I mean, I still do not see how, you know, where Boris Johnson is taking us is actually feasible. I, I, I don't see this as workable. And, and my own view is that there will have to be an extension uh, to what they're calling the implementation period. Uh, it's the wrong words, it's actually a transition period, because there will have to be an implementation after whatever is agreed. You, you really cannot agree something even in October and think all the customs and all the paperwork will, will be ready. But, but, but in a sense, it, it is Northern Ireland that is going to actually feel that from day one. And I think, therefore, the arguments that we need to put, and we will put um, over the next, well, it'll be, it'll be next week, in a sense, are, are symptomatic of what is our, our trading, our cultural, our free movement, um, mm. all those relationships uh, going to be afterwards, which will be li most live uh, within Northern Ireland. Um, and th th therefore, I think we will be, in a way, sowing the seed for th the realisation that actually this transition period is going to have to be further extended. David, what do you think? I doubt the Lords will be able to do anything very significant on Northern Ireland because the mm. Northern Ireland settlement is set out in the Northern mm. Ireland Protocol, which is mm. part of the withdrawal mm. agreement. And how many checks and declarations and so on you have at the border are really a matter of the inexorable logic of you know, what happens when you choose to put yourself outside a customs union and a single market. As far as the question of Parliament goes, my sense, and I, I speak as a, a, as a non-politician, which I say in humility rather than gloating, because I'm very glad I don't have to be a politician, but I, 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 those of us who would like to see a greater role for Parliament in our constitution, for example, when it comes to... Um, um, negotiating trade agreements and so on, I think have suffered a severe reverse over the past 12 months because Parliament did have a role because of the political situation and it didn't please Remainers and it didn't please Leavers. I think Remainers would say some tactical mistakes were made in Parliament by their side of the argument which has resulted in a much worse settlement than they hoped for and the Leavers I think have sold very successfully the idea that Parliament dithers, decides nothing and simply delays what the people have decided. It'll take a while I think for Parliament to recover its respect and its self-respect. Okay, I've got lots more questions, but let's go to your questions, and I'm going to take them in groups. There's Jess and Ketiki, so just immediately behind you, and Jess, if you can come here. Yes, first question. Yes, can you tell us who you are? Uh, George Peretz, um, a Bukuti at Moncton uh, Chambers. Uh, a question about the, independent, the provision relating to the Independent Monitoring Authority dealing with citizens' rights. Um, there are slightly worrying provisions in the Withdrawal Agreement Bill which seem to allow ministers to wind it up and transfer its functions. Um, 
uh, uh, more or less at the drop of a ministerial hat, so that the uh, authority yeah. looks as if it has rather less protection in terms of its statutory position than the groceries code adjudicator. Um, is there any prospect of those provisions being looked at? Okay, let's <coughs> yes here. And then. Honest, um, Can you tell us who you are? I'm David Lee from the House of Lords, a Labour member. We've just seen a non-dialogue about Scotland stroke the future of the union, and yet everyone knows this is looming up. This whole question about the future <coughs> of the union. And if people are going to uh, just have a, a, a dialogue of a death about this, mm -hmm. or a, a dialogue of two contradictory sets of assertions, mm -hmm. um, people out there might think it's a missed opportunity. For example, mm -hmm. is there not a way in which the SNP can't think about a way in which uh, we could uh, stay in the single market even under the present government through all four nations staying in the European economic area and so on. Now, um, people say, oh, that's all mm. dead. It can't be dead because if there is a way in which the four nations are going to stay together, there must be some such arrangement which can be considered. And I would ask whether the SNP is open to real discussion rather than relentlessly but going back to the process points. But we, we've okay. done that. Okay, Joanna, we'll come to that. Can we put forward a compromise. Go, no. yeah. Do, yes. yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. David Hanney, House of Lords. Uh, I wonder if the panel could comment on a point relating to the sequencing of the negotiations which are about to start. I don't imagine anyone in this room would defend the decision taken by the May government to concede the EU position on sequencing at the outset of the negotiations, which led to a pretty ghastly settlement. Uh, but does it not seem that when the government, and I noticed Stephen Crabb, you mentioned it straight away, simply talked about a free trade area for goods, you're making exactly the same mistake over again, because all the rest of our relationship, which is 80% of our trade, yeah. Uh, mutual recognition of, uh, of qualifications, internal security will go over a cliff on the 31st of December under that scenario. Shouldn't we be opening the negotiation across the whole waterfront? Okay, well, that's not immediately on the substance of the withdrawal agreement, Bill, but let's go to that first. Stephen, um, you know, under the previous version of the withdrawal agreement, Bill, the Parliament would have had to approve the mandate negotiation mm. within 30 days, I think, uh, uh, of our departing the EU. That's been that's one of the clauses that's been, been mm. dropped. Do you think the government actually has a plan on sequencing rather than just a date and a timetable? I, th I think it does have a plan. I think Boris Johnson has already on several occasions proved his doubters mm. and his sceptics wrong, and I was one of those doubters and sceptics a, a year ago. And the idea that he is going into this without a clear idea of what he wants at the end, I don't for one minute think that they've joined up all the dots and done all the colouring in yet, but they know where they want to get to. David Frost, who's leading the negotiations on behalf of the Prime Minister, is an incredibly smart individual. Um, and they are determined to r avoid the mistakes of the May government. Mm. They've had, you know, the, the May version. The, the, there's a, quite a good playbook mm. of things to avoid there. And they're determined to avoid those mistakes. So, yes, they'll want to start off the negotiations with a much clearer and united viewpoint about what they want from this than uh, Theresa May was able to do. And that was one of the things that bedeviled her negotiations mm. almost from day one. She was getting pushed around by different factions, and partly that was linked to some of the dynamics in Parliament and within, inside, the, uh, the, inside the Conservative <coughs> Party. But you're absolutely right. One of the key errors that, that we now look back on is the, the giving away of the, 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 the sequencing. And um, you know, part of the determination as well to show that we're absolutely serious about not extending the transition period is to um, you know, start off the negotiations on a stronger footing than what Theresa May was able, able to do. Now, I think that Boris Johnson is far, far more pragmatic than people give him credit for, and I think that uh, yeah, as we get 
towards the middle of the year. Um, it may well be that um, some elements of a trade deal package mm. can be signed off before the end of the year, but others won't be, and there will be further discussions and um, you know, extending discussions in, in, in other areas as, as well. Um, but for now, he's determined to show unity and show that he's got a united party behind him. I remember one of the more interesting um, Brexit Select Committee visits. Mm. I think, Joanna, were you on the visit to Brussels when we met with Martin Selmayr? No. And uh, you know, Martin Selmayr, a real <laughs> European Commission <laughs> bruiser, went round all of the members of the Select mm. Committee and said, well, look, if we were to make a bigger concession, I think mm. we were talking about the Northern Ireland <coughs> backstop, if we were to make a bigger concession to the UK government on this, would you then go back and vote for it? And one by one, I think I was in the minority of like two or three of us on the Select Committee, said, yes, we'll vote for it. And that was their point, it was the European uh, Union side felt all along that one of their big concerns was that Theresa May just couldn't deliver. And Boris Johnson uh, is in a strong position to be able to show his negotiating counterparts that he can actually deliver on this. And I think that's one of the things that's going to feed a more positive dynamic to the negotiations this year. So, Joanna, if we pick up, uh, pick up uh, Lord Lee's point, mm. um, is there actually any prospect of sort of constructive engagement between the government in Scotland and the government of the UK? If the government of the UK was out for saying, actually, we're going to do an FTA, but it's chapter by chapter, and we'd really like to know what you think on individual chapters and maybe build in yeah. some sort of single markety features on we, we, bits. I'm sure would my, you be up for constructive I'm engagement? I'm sure my colleagues in the Scottish Government would love to be consulted about ways in which what is now inevitable, Brexit and the deal to come, mm. could be ameliorated to protect mm -hmm. areas of the Scottish economy. Very importantly, to protect inshore mm. fisheries, which are the inshore fishing industry, which is massively important in Scotland, and about which we hear very mm. little. Most of its catch goes to the European Union, is exports to the European Union, uh, ways in which that could be protected. So we're in the business of doing our best to protect the Scottish economy. We know that this deal is going to go right. through, uh, but we won't vote for it. We won't vote for it because it's not our mandate, but we will look at ways of ameliorating it. The reality is that the British government have not shown any appetite, as Mike Russell explained mm. in some detail, mm. for discussing these sorts of issues. But to pick up on the point of, of the prospect of some sort of compromise around mm. staying in the single market and the customers' union. I very much fear that that ship has sailed, but I think it's important to put on the record that at a very early stage, in January 2017, the Scottish Government published a detailed document called Scotland's Place in Europe, which was very well received in Europe. Michelle Barney read it in detail and was very interested mm. in the proposals in it. The British Government rubbished it and wanted nothing to do with it. Now, the thesis of that document was looking at a compromise whereby the whole, all the nations of the UK could stay in the single market and the customs union, which failing there could be compromise positions whereby certain constituent parts, such as Scotland and Northern Ireland, that had voted remain, stayed in the single market and the customs union, but within the unitary state of the United Kingdom. Now, the British government weren't interested in talking about that. So I guess what I would like to deliver as, as a political message from Scotland today is that the ship has sailed on those mm. sorts of compromises. Yes, we'll look at compromising in areas we'd love, my colleagues in Edinburgh would love to be involved <coughs> in the free trade negotiations, but we won't be. I'm sure we won't be, because the British government has shown no inclination to do so so far. Yeah. No, 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 this is different. This is, this is about aspects right. of a free trade agreement. It's clear now that the British Parliament will have no truck with staying in the single market and customs union. The withdrawal agreement, which doesn't do that, has been approved. There's a, a, a special deal for Northern Ireland, but there's no special deal for Scotland. So much as we wanted to compromise on that, it would be incorrect to say that the SNP and the Scottish Government haven't tried to compromise. But, you know, I'm all in favour of, of cross-party working, and I, I think I showed that in the, in the last Parliament. And I, I'd like to see in Scotland the situation going forward for the SNP to do something to what the... Labour Party, who were in who, the Labour Party, who were very much the dominant force in Scotland in the 1990s, reached out to other parties and were involved in the Constitutional mm. Convention, which led to devolution. I would like to see similar cross-party discussions in Scotland as a run-up to this to the next independence referendum. I don't want it to just be about the SNP. I'd like all parties in Scotland to get round the table and talk about what they want Scotland's constitutional future to look like. But we have tried to compromise within the United Kingdom. Every single approach we made has been rebuffed. 
I wonder if I could just pick up George's point very, I want to, very I want to come on to yeah. that. So okay. you, no, well, if you want to make yeah. a point on it, then I was going to ask Dave and Diane about that, because I think it's a very interesting point about the IMA. I, 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 just, quick, I just quickly wanted to say, as I'm sure you know, George, yesterday my colleague uh, Stuart MacDonald, uh, myself and some other SNP MPs, had tabled a couple of amendments uh, which um, I'm sure you had some part in the advice that, that went to my colleague Stuart, uh, um, in which we were trying to make the independent Chief Inspector of Borders and Immigration responsible for appointing the non-executive members to the IME rather than the Secretary of uh, State. And also we were trying to secure that, uh, so far as possible, the numbers of non-executive members would exceed the number of executive members on the IME. Needless to mention, as I've said already, as will be the case with any amendment sponsored by the SNP in this parliament, it bit the dust with no government interest whatsoever. But I think that's something that will probably be revisited in the Lords. Well, let's go over. David, uh, Diane, what are you going to do? Look at the IMA. It's quite sort of an important piece of legislation. Lords before has stopped the government sort of just being able to abolish arms length <coughs> bodies by secondary legislation. Well, thank you. I mean, the crossbenchers have, have, have to be careful not to become the provisional wing of the SNP in the House of Lords. Um, it's a shame, in, in my view, there aren't real members of the SNP in the House of Lords, but I understand there are very pure constitutional reasons for that. No, George, let's be practical. Um, see what happens and, and let me know. Get in touch and we'll see what we can do. As far as sequencing is concerned, um, services. It's 80 percent of our economy. Obviously, we don't trade most of those, but it's what really matters to us. It's where we have a surplus. And somehow the debate has been channeled into this question of goods, particular emphasis mm. on, on tariffs. It's looking as though on most of mm. the important services for us, we're not mm. going to be getting mutual mm. recognition. Most we can hope for is equivalence. 30 days notice, the mm. EU can withdraw that equivalence. On data, I think we're going to have real difficulties even getting that far. Mm. Mm. So I, I do slightly despair. We seem to have started on the bit that they really want, and that's troubling. Mm. Dan, do you have concerns <coughs> about the Independent <coughs> Monitoring Authority? Uh, <coughs> sorry, I'm suffering. I shouldn't have come back from holiday, really. Yeah. Uh, uh, I do, and also, again, uh, as our Welsh colleagues, and probably yeah. the, the, the Scottish, they just haven't talked to me, is, you know, there are some of the citizens' issues that are particularly pertinent yeah. to Wales, and they get no say uh, uh, over this at all. So I th and we'll undoubtedly look at this. On the, I, I'm afraid I do have to come back. I remain a doubter about uh, Boris Johnson. I mean, the idea that, you know, they kept on saying he's wonderful, he's reopened the agreement, he's got a different mm -hmm. agreement. Yeah, he's got a much worse agreement. And, and this lack of detail, and I'm not even sure he understood how he could have, you know, uh, uh, agreed this Northern Ireland uh, as being better than what there was before is extraordinary. I think it's a, I think it's a great problem. So uh, I have enormous doubts about, about I'm afraid, about, about the Prime Minister and, uh, and that. And of course linked to our lack of oversight. It, it keeps yeah. coming back. Not only will we not have a, uh, any, uh, any grip over the mandate, but how it's going. And you know the the talk of trade, even with it with just on goods, it it assumes that goods are that's all you've got to do is work out whether there are customs arrangements, not about the environmental impact, not about the consumer rights attached to them, not about all the other issues. Um, and actually, when you get into that, there are a lot of really really difficult mm. issues. And the idea this is all simple and can be tied up by October. Um, you know, it, it's just fanciful, it really is. So it, it's partly an issue of sequencing, but even then, you know, there's almost no trade deal, no goods deal that doesn't have a service component to it. As David just said, there'll be data ones. You know, it, it, you know when I talked to, I think it was Rolls-Royce, they know in each of their engines that they sell, uh, and they get delivered. They know as an aeroplane is touching down in Singapore, they know exactly which screws were put in when, at what date, what size they are. And, and if one goes wrong, they know they can exactly, their people can go out, which is the service part of it, put the right screw back in. So the idea, these are just physical things that can be agreed and don't include whether it's the free movement of those people going over to service the engine or it's the intellectual property over that, or it's the data protection. Um, it is not as easy as the government makes it sound between goods on the one hand and, and services on the other. So it's, uh, uh, you know, it, it is a real issue of, of not just sequencing, but this is not as 
simple and black and white as if we were just selling cauliflowers to someone. Though I'm sure cauliflowers yeah. have their own Let's issues. take another round of questions because we're coming up against time. Oh. I'm going to run slightly late on the grounds that we started five minutes late, if that's all right with everybody. Yeah. And then we're down at the front. Just yes. William Wallace, Libwood Oak up here. Um, I just want to confirm on the assumptions about shrinking the role of Parliament. I asked the Minister of Weaving last night why Clause 31 <coughs> of the previous bill, which was about parliamentary scrutiny over future trade negotiations, was not included in the bill and was told that the government's mandate from the majority it received in the general election now provides the authority for the government to negotiate that and doesn't need further parliamentary yeah. scrutiny. Now, that is a definition of democracy uh, which excludes continuing scrutiny of government as government proceeds, which is profoundly worrying. Okay, thank you. Let's... Yes. Sorry, um, I'm another Lib Dem peer, <laughs> Sarah Ludford, I'm a Brexit spokesman in the Lords. Um, I uh, wanted to ask about Clause 26, the one that allows ministers to make, um, uh, uh, by delegated powers, allow lower courts to depart yeah. from rulings of the Supreme Court on EU law. Um, will, I mean, we had a meeting with Lord Callanan last night, as William said, and uh, we didn't get any explanation or or what they would attempt as a justification for this, is it any more than revenge on the Supreme Court and part of the power grab for the executive? Would they try to put forward some apparent justification? Okay, let's, let's ask Stephen that very quickly. Do you know the thinking behind, because that's a new bit for the bill that we didn't have back in, uh, back in October? Uh, I'm really sorry, Jill. I'm not going to be able to add any more wisdom no? to that no? issue than what you David, had last night. David, any thoughts about that? You've already raised know, that, but, something but, you're but concerned in a, about. In a spirit of, of cross-bench uh, above the fray, mm. impartiality, I would say that it's a particularly pernicious thing about the timing <laughs> of this bill, and it's not really anybody's yeah. fault. But we find ourselves in a, in a position where we don't have committees, even in the mm. Lords. We don't yeah. have a constitution committee, we don't have a delegated <laughs> legislation committee. We need the weight of those bodies behind exactly these sort of points to analyse you know, what the reasons are to interrogate ministers and to guide the rest of us <coughs> in terms of um, how we seek to amend and how we vote. Since we come to committees, very quickly, Stephen and Joanna, you're both very distinguished members of the Exiting the EU Committee. Mm. We're told DEXU goes. Uh, we therefore expect Exiting the EU Committee to go. Do you have thoughts on how the Commons should effectively scrutinise the next stage? Does it need a sort of cross-cutting committee or quite what, Joanna? I, I mean, I think it does need a cross-cutting committee. I know some people were very were critical of the existence of DEXU and I know you, the IFG yeah, has, has, has produced yeah. some interesting analysis of that. But, you know, I think it, it cannot be doubted that some of the most effective scrutiny of the process of exiting the European Union came from the Brexit Select mm. Committee, chaired by Hilary Benn. And I really would like to pay tribute to Hilary. Mm. I mean, honestly, a job at the United Nations beckons. Because, you know, to get through, <laughs> uh, in, 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 the, in the last parliament but one, you know, he got through mm. a couple of reports unanimously. Mm. And then he went on to get through a number of reports, with not unanimous, there were a few Brexiteers who really felt they couldn't support the reports. But, you know, there were other, cons yeah. other conservative <coughs> members of the committee uh, uh, like Stephen, you know, we very much worked cross-party on that committee, I think, and people did try to put aside their tribal uh, allegiances. And I think some of the reports we produced with the assistance of witnesses, some of whom are sitting in this room, were really vital to people's detailed understanding of what, 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 was, at, what was at stake. And I think the absence of committees, of a committee like that, to ask those cross-cutting questions it, it, it will, be a, will be a sad thing and, I, and I've no doubt that it's not been a, I'm sure that it's been a consideration in Boris Johnson's mind in getting rid of the Department of Exiting the European Union that in doing so he also gets rid of such an effective select committee with such an effective uh, chairperson. Stephen, do you, do you yeah, have any thoughts about Very quickly, I'd agree with much of what uh, Joanna says but it did feel to, to us that in the last few months of the, of the year that that committee had really run out of steam. It felt like the job had been done. Um, I see the opportunity in the new parliament of uh, a beefed up trade committee. That's what I would like mm. to see because the focus is very much going to move at the, after the end of January to the, the minutiae of trade deals. We're all going to have mm. to become experts mm. On, mm. On, on trade deals and I think there's a real opportunity in the House of Commons for a kind of a more turbocharged trade committee, perhaps reflecting uh, yeah. a new government yeah. department to do that. 
I'm very sorry. I mean, your committee has made yeah. it brilliant, but I have to say, Lord Jay, and the <laughs> EU committees in the House of Lords yeah. were far yeah. superior. And, uh, and, I, <laughs> and actually, the reports that they did, I mean, they have been absolutely yeah. superb. They, they, they really have. Can I just say on, on, on the trade, I mean, there, there is a real issue there because, it, uh, okay, I can at least understand there's a reason for not doing CRAG on, on the current uh, bill because we yeah. will have other things. But actually, CRAG is not good enough. There is not enough. Uh, grasp over trade bills, over trade at the moment, and we're going to have to put that on. I do think it's an area where the Lords may have a particular role. I haven't had the chance yeah. to talk to um, uh, Lord Jay and others <coughs> on this, but, but actually uh, uh, the, the sort of work that will be needed on a trade bill, um, uh, on a, sorry, on a trade deal, I think will be, will, be, will be really important. Our committees, by the way, are going to be set, set up rather more quickly. Good. We're moving very fast to at least have the EU and I think the constitutional one set up within d days now. Well, yeah. so will no. have been set up? Okay. okay, excellent. So we'll Lord Jay intervened to say that the committee is set up on Thursday for people who can catch that. I'm going to give final comment question to Professor Meg Russell from the Constitution Unit, and then I've got one more question for you, depending on what well, she Thank asked. you for introducing yeah. me. That saves me time. <laughs> I'm just fair to say this by the comment from William Moore at Wallace and something that was said earlier on the panel. I just find that the, um, the attitude of this government to, to Parliament is somewhat illogical, and I think we're in, the, we're in a position where... The, the government is kind of trying to fight the last war. I mean, we often get caught in this trap. Somebody said on the panel earlier um, that, of course, they're so much stronger in Parliament now that they don't have to bother about Parliament. They're writing it out everything, of everything. And that is completely the wrong approach. You know, they are strong now in the House of Commons. They don't have to worry about the House of Commons. Therefore, they can afford to put scrutiny in. And good scrutiny makes for good government, as, as um, Robin Cook used to say. You know, just shining the light on what the government is doing and forcing them to explain in public why they are doing what they are doing in front of people who are their friends in the House yeah. of Commons is actually good for government. Yeah. And I wonder, particularly maybe from Stephen, whether those lessons will be learned and we will yeah. move away from this position, which does seem just, just dangerous for good quality policy. So, Stephen, this government does seem quite scrutiny averse <laughs> on its revealed preferences to date. Do you um, think that's fair? Look, we're, we're in very yeah. early days. The, the, when jo Boris Johnson became Prime Minister in the summer, the mission was all about getting us to the election mm. and, and through that. The, and, you know, let, let's be honest about it, the victory that he secured was, was pretty spectacular. Mm. Um, now, that doesn't mean that he's let off the hook in terms of scrutiny. I say that as a mm. Conservative yeah. backbencher. I want to see Parliament play a mm. full role. Um, but I, I think as time goes on and, you know, he is properly gets properly set up in what he's doing. Then um, I, w I would hope that there would be opportunities to bring Parliament more on board with scrutiny. Can I just ask our other then, please? Just final question from me. Um, the withdrawal agreement bill will go through. We all sort of more or less think that. But there's a whole raft of other Brexit legislation mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. failed in the last Parliament. Was basically the government never brought back because it faced so many amendments on it. Can we take it that by by the summer, it's pretty likely we'll have a trade bill on the statute book, the agriculture bill, the fisheries bill, the immigration bill, you know, the numbers of, oh, yeah, by whatever. When? By when? By the summer, by the end of the year. I mean, we need these things actually to prepare for life after Brexit. These are the things that set up the new agriculture regime, the new fisheries regime, you know, trade <coughs> regimes or whatever. Are those, are those going to go through as easily and swiftly or whatever, do you think? Whatever. Joanna. Well, I, I assume so because of the majority that Boris Johnson has and also because his, the MPs sitting behind him are a very different group from the last Tory group in Parliament where there were a lot of rebels and mavericks on both wings. I think most people now are signed up uh, to the project and even if he were to have a few rebels, he can handle that easily with the majority he has. But I just point this out. He did win a spectacular majority in England. He didn't win a spectacular majority in Wales. His party was trounced in Scotland. And of course, Northern Ireland continued to vote in the main for Remain parties. So there is a tension here. And uh, I'm not saying this just to further my agenda. My agenda is an independent Scotland because I think that will be better for, the, for Scotland society and economy. But for those of you who believe in the union, ask yourselves, is it sustainable? 
for three out of the four constituent parts of that union to be treated as though they hadn't voted at all, and for your overwhelming narrative to be Boris Johnson has won a tremendous victory, brackets in England, therefore anything that Boris Johnson and his party want must go and must be imposed upon Scotland and Northern Ireland, and to a certain extent on Wales also. Is that really a sustainable uh, position in a union, is it really? David, so, Diane, do you think there are going to be problems from... From the Lords on well, that. Jana, I have to speak up on behalf of my Scottish relatives yeah. <laughs> who feel very, very strongly part of a union and constantly mm -hmm. remind me that the majority mm -hmm. of Scots still appear to feel that, that way if you if you So in a sense it depends on So we'll have more events on that yeah. to But I, I won't tackle with you on that because uh -huh. so we're great friends in other yeah. respects. Mm -hmm. um, as to those bills, yes, I, I suppose they'll go through and they need to go through. I and mean, if we really are going to reap the dividends of Brexit mm -hmm. by doing anything differently after we've left, and particularly you think of agriculture, where I think there are some um, really interesting things we could try to do, um, uh, then we need the legislation yeah. in place. Diane, um, uh, lots of concerns expressed before about some of the substance. The, 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 there's, there's two concerns. I mean, there is the substance, and you know, okay, if you just, you know, every time we talk to the government now, they just mm. go 80, 80. Um, and and if, if that's the way they're going to play it, they can get these through. But as the more they look at them, these. There's going to be a whole lot of other issues. We're going to need to look at who's going to do the supervision that the um, it, Commission's mm. been doing at the moment, whether it's over environment or all sorts of things, so we may need extra mm. bits of legislation. Because actually I don't think Boris and his team have looked at the detail, and I think as they begin to do this, they will suddenly see there are lots of gaps, not all of which can be done even under the powers they've given on, on, under regulation, because some of these will be um, some, some big supervisory mm. issues. Mm. Um, so it's when you said the summer, I'm thinking, mm, you know, we're, we're virtually, we'll be in February before they start any of this now. Um, there, there are things like Easter, you know. Yeah. Oh, during this session, during You know, this is, the, 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 I think this, this is going to be quite demanding, particularly if they want to do all the other things and repeal yeah. the um, uh, fixed-term Parliament Act and they want to do all this other stuff. Um, you know, there is legislative um, time that is needed on this. Mm -hmm. But there is implementation time as well needed for some of the things, I think. I, I know, absolutely. Things we've lost a lot of time by, uh, by not moving perhaps as quickly as... Stephen, where's the first rebellion going to come from? from? <laughs> <laughs> That's a brilliant question. I, I, I don't know. There's very little appetite for, for that at, at this point. Uh, it could be years before we see any significant rebellion on, on our side. Look, I always love listening to Joanna. She's very, very effective uh, voice for the SNP in, in Parliament. And I'm sure she will be one of those people in the future who will look back on 2019 as some kind of halcyon period in the, in the House of Commons where the government was able to be tied up and in the name of scrutiny day after day, tying up the government in knots. Um, you know, playing this very, very tactical game. I forget who it was who said that tactics without strategy is just noise before defeat. I agree and that's that. actually the reality. I agree with that. And so many missed opportunities. If you think that the current situation isn't satisfactory for Scotland, for the United Kingdom, in terms of how we do the negotiations, you passed up the opportunity no, no, no. for something okay. else. When you say you, okay. when, when you, say you, <coughs> you cannot say that about the SNP, because as I said in reply to his lordship earlier, the SNP put forward, the Scottish Government put forward compromises which were rubbished. So don't blame us for the lack of compromise. The Conservative and Unionist Party was not interested in talking to Scotland's government, and it still isn't. I, I think this debate will run and run, <laughs> uh, she said. That's true. And there is obviously a big programme of work in the Institute for Government looking at, the, uh, at uh, all those issues around uh, the future of the union, so do watch out for that. So could I just ask you, sorry to overrun slightly, but could I just ask all of you to thank our fantastic panellists? <laughs>